Yes, Jesus. Yes, you are good. Yes, you are good. Yes, you're good. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, thank you that it's not based on me and my actions and my goodness. Oh, what a hopeless, hopeless transaction that would be. It's about you, Jesus. It's about you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Hmm. Thank you, worship team. Hmm. It's good. It's good. Let's pray. Hmm. Lord, again, we just submit our spirits to you. We submit our hearts. We yield. We yield to you, Lord. Hmm. Father, come and speak to our hearts. Continue the work that you've already begun. And God, we ask that you would carry it forward into the remainder of this day, this week, the days, the weeks, and months moving forward, Lord. We need you in every part of, in every moment of our days. Amen. Good work. <laughs> the yielding. Oh, the yielding to Him. I get this picture in my mind of an uncontrolled intersection in the country. Two vehicles speeding hastily towards the same intersection. The Spirit of God is wanting to have His way, to have the right of way in your life. Will you slow down and allow that to happen? Will you yield? The stop sign is more of a command. It's more of an arbitrary thing. But the yield is voluntary. You could speed up and get ahead of what he wants to do. Or you could slow down and let him lead you. And let him go before you. Hmm. We're going to talk this morning about humility. Um, you start in Genesis 40. Genesis 40, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> this is um, a small portion of Joseph's life. Uh, if you know that story, um, or if you don't, I'd encourage you to go and read it. In Genesis, um, this little chunk of his life, we're not even going to focus a lot on Joseph. We're going to focus on a couple characters in his story. Uh, some small characters that um, that I think have, has a significant picture for us. So there's a cupbearer and there's a bread maker. So sometime later, the cupbearer and the bread maker and the king uh, of the king of Egypt offended their master and the, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in, in custody in the house of the captain of the guard. Uh, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. So the reason in those days, a cupbearer or the baker, these were kind of like your butlers. These were the people who were bringing him different types of food. They were serving the king. And, uh, and what they would do in those days is they would have the chief cupbearer or baker or whoever was in charge of whatever was being made for food, they would actually sample the food before the king would eat it. Why is that? Well, if there was poison in it, if someone had done something to it, then the person who tasted it in front of the king, basically they would vouch that it's good. They had supervised it. It was safe because if it's safe, I'll eat it. Make sense? So the king is suspicious. He's not so suspicious that, I mean, if he had, if he had definitive proof, these two lads, their lives would have come to an end. 
But he's suspicious that something's going on in the kitchen. He's suspicious that the, bre- the, the baker isn't being completely honest. He doesn't like the food that's coming in. Something's going on. He's suspicious that there might be some nefarious intention as well with the cupbearer. So he throws them in jail. We're going to drop down to verse 21. When he restored the chief cupbearer to his position uh, so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But uh, he impaled the chief baker just as Joseph has said to them in his interpretation. So here's kind of these two guys. Their story comes to an end. One is tragic. And the other has a happy ending. The king clearly decided that the, the baker was, uh, was someone he could not trust and was someone who, who was doing something you know, against him. And so he lost his life. The cupbearer, the king decided that he could trust. The cupbearer, he decided that he could trust. Bread speaks of what, uh, what is presented Um, The bread of what is presented in the context to public ministry is our teaching, singing, ministry, style, etc. The different platform ministries that we do, these different things that we present to the world. A ministry ministry may grow in popularity, but if it does not uh, inspire humility, eventually it will lose its voice in the kingdom of God. So there can be ministries rise... If you're following the Christian kind of world at all, there's a few big ones recently that come to my mind. Ravi Zacharias. Huge global influence. This massive ministry. Right? It rises and everything looks amazing. And once he passes away, then all of a sudden we hear about some of the things that have been going on behind the surface. He'd been abusing, manipulating. It was not good. I think of Hill songs. How much worship in the church has changed because of what Hill songs has done over the last 30 years. It's dynamically and dramatically changed the face of worship music in the body of Christ. And there's scandal all over their ministry right now. All over it. Just because it's big, and just because lots of people are drawn to it, does not mean that everything's okay. It doesn't mean that everything's okay. Just because it's small doesn't mean everything's okay either. What I want to present this morning is the true marker is humility. I don't care whether it's small, I don't care whether it's big, there's actually a context that um, Dana and I know about that we're concerned. And it's like, oh my goodness, what's going on there? There may even be some good markers. You know, people are engaging. There's some growth. But it doesn't feel like there's humility in it. So how are we operating? And this goes into even what we talked about this morning. If we do not produce fruit in keeping with repentance, if we do not produce in our own lives a standard and a lifestyle of humility before the Lord, where it's not about emotionalism, it's not about some fantastic show, it's about going before the face of Jesus. It's about interacting and connecting with His heart and let the chips fall where they may. If there's those that want to follow us, that's fine. Jesus in His ministry, His, his, uh, his following ver- uh, fluctuated dramatically from thousands upon thousands to even His 12 closest walked away from Him at the end. Jesus was left alone. you got to think, you know, the few short days from the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, people are like celebrating. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a festival happening, a parade as Jesus enters the city. <clears throat> a few short days later, he's alone, bleeding and dying on a cross. If, if we were to use our markers for successful ministry and apply them to Jesus' ministry and his life, How would we grade him? 
Well, it's Jesus. We have to grade him at an A+. Right? He left, he left the disciples and 120 people in a room. That was the end of his ministry. It's not small, but here's what he said. He's like, it's better if I go. Because when the Spirit of God comes upon you guys, it's this thing is going to break out across the entire planet. It's better if I go. So many times we look at even the persecution of Jerusalem. The Romans come in and they get sick and tired of the Jews being a pain in the butt. And so they come in and they completely demolish the city. Now what does it do to the church in Jerusalem? At that point in time, they're actually kind of getting along with their Jewish cousins, I guess you could say. <clears throat> they're trying to convert the Jews to Christianity, to, to Jesus, to the way. This, this, this uh, hammer comes down on Jerusalem, scatters them throughout the entire area. Before that time, you've got like Paul and a few other guys going around trying to like advance the gospel in the region at large. But when Jerusalem is crushed, in the midst of crisis, what happens? The gospel begins to spread. We need to humble ourselves. And that's the place of excitement when we see the intensity, when the, when the, when the alarm bells are sounding, when the, <clears throat> the crisis is imminent. What do we do? We humble ourselves and we go before the Lord and we say, Jesus, we need you. Without you, nothing matters. Without your leadership in my life, nothing matters. So what is the bread in our lives? What is the things that have come in to our lives that are causing us to be contaminated to the point where God is going to say, you know what, I'm going to cut off your ministry. I'm going to cut it off. I think it's interesting and I'm not going to draw a strong theological parallel. <clears throat> but the cupbearer survived. If we look at the spiritual symbolism of that, that's the Spirit of God. If we look at the bread, that's the Word of God. I, I see this and I'm going, to, I'm going to make this statement and I'm going to leave it hanging. Because <laughs> I don't want to say any more because I don't want to be critical. But I think that a large part of the evangelical church has leaned so hard on the scriptures that they have abandoned the spirit and they will not survive. It is dead and it is dying. And I am not critical of the scriptures. If you listen to my preaching at all, I, have, I focus on the word of God strong. And I am a champion for those who, who, who advocate for the word of God, for strong theological uh, uh, teaching and preaching. I'm in that camp. But here's the truth. If you have only the word and no spirit, it's dead. Yeah. has no life. Yeah. On the other side, <laughs> the other side's coming. If you have only spirit, it's chaos. And nothing will come of it. In fact, it, it goes off into all kinds of crazy, kooky things when not grounded with the Word. If you do not ground the Spirit of God's move with the Word of God, you're in chaos, and that will never last either. It will fizzle out and die. <clears throat> but if you don't have the Spirit with the Word, you're like a mouthful of flour. <laughs> You all got a mental picture there. <laughs> right? <laughs> Have you ever, you ever played that game where you eat a cracker, a dry cracker, and then first one to whistle? <laughs> no. That's the word without some spirit, without some, some flowing. <laughs> you half choke on your own tongue trying to whistle. <laughs> We should have tried it this morning. We should have had competition. <laughs> Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. His yoke comes with humility and gentleness. 
humility and gentleness. I want to say this. Let's create a culture in your life as an individual and my life as an individual, as a church, a culture of humility where we go, let's just be humble and gentle. <clears throat> There's lots of avenues we could go down. How do you talk about other believers? How do you talk about other situations? Do we promote even inside our groups talking about each other? Or do we humble ourselves and speak with gentleness towards others? Zephaniah 3, verses 1 to 11. <clears throat> On that day, you shall not be put to shame because your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove, you, I will remove from your midst uh, your proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in, in, in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst... A people humble and lowly. Oh, verse 12. Put it on your kitchen cup, uh, uh, fridge. Stick it on your mirror in your bathroom. But he's going to leave us a people. You be the person. Lord, let me be the people who are humble and lowly. In the midst of all the crazy chaos, let's be humble. Let's humble ourselves. The way that ministries go out, the way that we present ourselves to the world, even to other believers, what we teach or impart, how we do our platform ministry, our style, and why we do uh, uh, what we do uh, to bring, is it to bring more attention to Jesus or more atten attention to ourselves? Our ministry... How, how can we say that better? I have ministry here, but your life in Christ, your witness as a believer must flow from humility and must produce humility in the people whom you minister to. We must go low. I am telling you, God will not reproduce us if we do not humble ourselves before Him. Unless we, we, we walk in a lifestyle presenting a restrained a restrained presentation of the gospel. Now, I told you that, you know, a little bit of my testimony in the past about going through in the mid-90s, late 90s, that um, um, new wine, I think was the title they put on it, this new wine kind of refreshing that poured over, you know, Canada and into the United States and around the world. Our little church in Prince Albert, we didn't even tr plan for it. Not that anyone plans for it. But God just began to break in, and it was crazy. There was people many times where they would be laid out on the floor at the church for hours. You know, people I went to school with, I was in high school at the time, people I went to school with, and I would see how they lived their life, and I'm like, huh. Was that God? We would literally, we would have a service. The room was packed out. It might have been a little bit smaller than this. We would move all the chairs to the side because the floor would be full of people just laid out. Fully laid out. If you don't believe in being slain in the Spirit, <laughs> I've seen people get slain in the Spirit <laughs> where you cannot deny that that was God. I saw a big guy about my size we had an upright piano off to the side. It was actually on this part of this, just off the stage. It was this big upright piano. You know, they have those big arms where the keyboard is. Well, he fell over and hit his shoulder and it twisted him 90 degrees and he smacked against the floor. No worse for wear. It didn't even phase him. Everyone was like, whoa. What just happened? But I've also seen people that I'm like, hmm, I wonder. But you know what? The Lord spoke to me. I remember actually standing. It was on uh, off to the side, all the chairs. I was standing against the chairs. We'd stacked up chairs and moved everything to the side and all this chaos. And it was crazy. People laughing and it never really hit me like it hit everyone else. I never really laughed like crazy. I mean, it was funny because when you're in a room full of people laughing, you know what that's like? It's contagious. But I never got 
the, the thing, whatever it was. And I remember thinking to myself, looking at it, and I'm like, God, am I just standing here judging? Am I like a stubborn, unyielding spirit that just wants to judge people? And I felt him very clearly say to my heart, I don't know, I was been 14, 15, somewhere in there. And he said to me, he's like, do you feel my presence? I said, yes, you're here, Lord, I feel you. He's like, then what more do you want? I was like, okay. The second thing he said, he's like, don't judge. He's like, it's not your job to decide whether it's right or it's wrong for that person. Let me do the judging. Let me work it out. <clears throat> Our story in Genesis, the master, the king, is the one who's going to figure out, who's going to divide, okay, this, right? This is not okay. This is okay. It is not my job. <laughs> it is not your job to discern the heart of a person. That is only for Holy Spirit to do and only for you to do for you. I want to challenge us. You've got more work than what you can handle just d discerning your own heart. Never mind trying to discern someone else's intentions and, you know, some other leader or some other Christian or some other church or some other ministry. It's like, no, how about you just, you know, it's the whole the uh, speck and plank parable that Jesus talked about. I think for most of us, you know, you think of a plank, I think of like a two by four. <laughs> What would happen if you had a two by four stuck in your eye? <laughs> but you're sitting there trying to pick out someone else's little like sawdust. Yeah. And they're, they're like, dude, take care of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's a funny mental picture, isn't it? I think of like an eight foot two by four and I'm like, yeah, there'd be bigger problems than that two by four at that point. <laughs> but guys, let's take care of our own stuff. Humble ourselves enough to say, I've got my own issues and intentions. Lord, I want you to work in me. I'm broken. I am weak. I've got, I've got issues. I've got stuff I need to work out. For most of us, if you don't have that list started yet, start with, start with being judgmental. <laughs> How easy is it for you to go and look around and see where other people are doing wrong or should be, shouldn't be? Man, so-and-so, if they were here at church today, this message is for them. <laughs> well God didn't bring them he brought you he brought you we need to humble ourselves how do we present this are we seeking um, <clears throat> some seek their identity in power and want to be seen as more passionate anointed or sensitive to the spirit of God than others be careful Many could have, as, as, I, as a young man, with the work that God was doing in my life, I never fell over, I never laid on the floor laughing. There was people literally had to be carried out of the church at the end of the night because it's like 10.30 at night. It's like, we got to go home. People literally getting carried out. We had those services for six months straight, every single night. You tell me that wasn't a move of God. You tell me that was all human, human effort. <clears throat> I could <laughs> I could go into how hard it is to um, to get volunteers to help out with things. Having a full worship team, ushers, offering, full service from six thirty to ten o'clock every night for six months. Who's signing up? No one put up their hand. Right behind you. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> the church was full. Amen. And overflowing. At the end of that move of God, we went from 40, 50, 60 people. Within about a year and a half period, we went to over 500. You tell me that wasn't a move of God. You tell me that there was some... Our pastor, he was anointed fiery preacher... But he wasn't anything special. He allowed the Spirit of God to move. That he did, for sure. He didn't try and control it. He said, okay, Lord, if you're doing this, here we go. 
tons of miraculous things happened in that period, time period. God moved. But it wasn't about a person. It wasn't about <clears throat> some sort of crazy. But we saw it, people trying to drum up the Spirit of God moving. I remember as that season ended, and then people tried, and it was like, it wasn't the same. That season had, had shifted and passed. Was God still moving? Yes, but not like that. He's not going to move the same way again. He just won't. <clears throat> we need to make sure that as the Spirit moves in the future, we think about you know, that revival in, in that uh, college uh, in Asbury. Uh, Where's that? Kentucky, I think? Yeah. Small little, you know, kind of out of the way place. Could God do that here? Mike, that's my first question. Lord, do that here. Have your spirit come in and move here. But I don't want just a refreshing. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not satisfied with that. If you never lived through something like that, I'm sorry. Go visit Asbury. <laughs> but what I want is revival. Revival and refreshing are different. Revival is sinners coming to Jesus. Refreshing is a really good service and God moving powerfully so that we have services. What was it, February 8th they started and they're still going? Am I right on that? Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Somewhere in there. Yeah. <clears throat> Straight worship and prayer without stopping. That's intensity. That's intensity. I'm like, wow, Lord, come and move in our, our midst like that. But if we're going to have the Spirit move, we have to be open to what God is going to do. If there's, if there's a resistance to God's manifestation because we're not familiar with it, or it's uncomfortable, that's a problem. We need to humble ourselves and go before the Lord and say, the thing is, that move of God that I experienced, there was many pastors. In fact, there's one uh, in, in our denomination out east because that was a part, that was uh, the Toronto Blessing. If you know anything about that, that was happening at the same time. There was a pastor in Ontario who was like, that is not God. That is not God. God would not do that. That's nowhere in Scripture. I don't see it. He eventually went to one of the meetings. God laid him out. <laughs> Come back to his church, and it started happening there. He didn't do anything different. He had even resisted the move of God. And he went and he got it and he brought it back home accidentally. It's contagious. It really was, though. There's hundreds of stories like that where leaders would go to that move they would sit for a few services, a weekend or something of that, or a week, church leaders, and they'd go back home, and even to the point where nothing would happen to them. It would just be like, okay, that was a good worship service, and then there's a bunch of crazy people laughing and rolling around and being silly. And I'm wondering whether this is actually you, God. And then they go back to their home church, and they're, they're preaching just as dull and boring as they always did. People falling asleep, and he's preaching too long. <laughs> Not this church. <laughs> no. Ooh, ten minutes. And the Spirit of God breaks in. And revival breaks out. But we want people saved. The only way the church needs to be revi refreshed, yes. Those of us who have been in the body of Christ for a long period of time, we need some of, 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 of Lindy's Fire and passion for Jesus. 47 years I thought God hated me and I hated Him. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life pouring my life out to the one that I now love, who I realize loves me from eternity past to eternity future. I will do nothing but live my life proclaiming who He is. Yes, Jesus. Yes. We need to be refreshed unto the lost seeing Jesus and seeing God for who He truly is and coming and turning to Him. I am not satisfied. I've seen it before. It's great. Sure, if that happened in our church, I'm not going to be there stopping it. I'm going to be like, this is pretty cool. But you know what didn't happen in that move that I experienced? 
true revival. Did people come to know the Lord? Yes. Oh, 100% people were coming to Jesus. But it wasn't on mass. It wasn't a revival. It was a refreshing. The church got refreshed, which is good and necessary. It was a true work of God, but we want the lost to come in. And if we're resistant to the manifestation just because we're uncomfortable with it, who is it here one time? It was like we were praying for them and we didn't know them very well and they fell over. And I'm like, oh, we got a crazy one here, right? And when they came back up, they were like, that's never happened to me before in my life. I was like, really? I guess we're the crazy ones. <clears throat> Those who are willing to accept the manifestation of God's spirit and bear the reproach of it will only persevere through humility. You know what that move in the 90s did? The churches that it impacted? The rest of the body of Christ did not look very kindly on them. They had to be humble. They had to humble themselves and go, it's not my thing. I never started it. I never did it. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's about Him touching people's hearts and their lives. The other side that we did see, sure, there was exaggeration of, of manifestation. And, it, and, and I want to, manifestation, when we think about this, we think about people you know, falling over and rolling in laughter and, and that, the crazy things, people yelling and groaning and grunting. If you've never been in a service where that stuff happens, I, I, I hope it happens here at least a little bit yes. <laughs> so, that it can hum, so that it can humble us. So that it can humble us. Yeah. Lord, do it again so that I can confront my self-righteous pride and I can get over myself. That there's more important things. It's about God moving. For those who have exaggerated manifestations and want to draw attention to themselves, we got to get rid of that too. Here's the thing. is those on the other side of this that, that don't believe that, that God moves like that and think that the whole movement, all those refreshing things are just you know, people putting it on. Because of these exaggerations and these, you know, inflaming the things. Like the one thing that used to happen, we used to do, oh, see, I can do it in this microphone. Is the guy, Cecil Glover, he was awesome. <laughs> he'd, he'd be praying and he'd go like this. And then people would start laughing. And he'd go, more Lord. And people would fall over. I saw it. Like people just completely like a wave, just fall over. I could feel the spirit of God move in that room. So then what do we do? Every preacher go home and blow into their microphone? <laughs> well, you can try. <laughs> You're all sitting. It's a good thing. Everybody stand up. We'll try it again. No. <laughs> but my point in this is that we don't want to over-exaggerate. I don't want to go and pretend and, 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 and just puppet, parrot, and mimic something that God is doing. I want him to move, actually. I need to humble myself and go, I don't, want to, I don't want to twist and manipulate and make something happen that's not happening. I want the Spirit of God to do something authentic and genuine. <clears throat> without my control, without, without anyone manipulating, without any exaggerated stuff, <clears throat> if we try and manipulate it, try and manipulate this manifestation to make our, look, our ministry look anointed, we need to repent. Humble ourselves and repent for trying to be something that we're not. Now, we're the crazy charismatics. I literally, there's people in our community that think we're nuts. Think we're a cult. I've heard the rumors. I've been here long enough. It comes around. People are afraid of this church because they think we're crazy. Some of you, they may have hit it right on the head. <laughs> I'm not going to say who. I'm going to stare at the floor on that one. <laughs> but our reputation is not great. Because people think we're crazy. Because we've, maybe the spirit has been manipulated in the past. Maybe it has been exaggerated. Maybe it has been not healthy. We need to humble ourselves. Part of our repentance in the beginning of January, boy, oh boy, was that awesome. Yeah. We were like, Lord, forgive us. I, was I here for that? Some of you weren't here for that. Some of you may have been. But we as a group said, Lord, we repent. Yeah. 
Forgive us for where we've exaggerated and, and manipulated your move and actually brought, brought scorn to his name in our community and in our land. And we say, Lord, forgive us. Why? So that you will move in our land again. So you come back, not so that Aspen Ridge will be some great church. And here's the prayer of my heart. God, I don't care what church you started in. He's challenged me with this. What, David, what if you invest in a year of prayer and fasting? What if you invest in the spirit moving in Athabasca and another church revival breaks out and people start getting saved in the hundreds? I go, Jesus, do it now. Do it now. Why? Because it's not about Aspen Ridge. It's not about me. In fact, I'm going to get more riches and glory if that happens. I'm a jealous person. I'm actually quite greedy. I want my reward to last for eternity. Not just for a few years here. That's why Jesus looked at his ministry. The father looked at his ministry that looked like a failure from the outside and went, no, no, no. This is the greatest ministry the, the creation has ever known. His reward will go on. That's what my reward needs to be. We need to invest in this. Is this my last scripture? I've got a few more. Let's go through them. Um, Matthew 6. Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is emphasizing humility. Be careful. Not to practice your righteousness in front of others, seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your, from your Father in heaven. Right? <clears throat> Heard a story of an evangelist or a, a preacher, and they're on a stage, and they, they spoke this amazing word, and got this ovation from the crowd, and everybody was like, oh, that was so good. And, you know, and they're clapping, a standing ovation. This person walked off the stage, a senior leader said to them, did you enjoy that? They're kind of taken back. What do you mean? Well, did you enjoy the applause? Well, you better, senior leader said, because that's your reward. You got it right there. It was like, oh, yeah. It's not about the applause of men. That's what Jesus is saying here. Verse 2. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. <sighs> but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. You want to be rich for all of eternity? Do lots of really good things to lots of people, as many as you can, and don't let anyone know about it. Do you want to know even true joy here on this planet? If you've never done that, <laughs> oh, I want to encourage you, start small, but do it somewhere. Bless someone and, and orchestrate it in such a way that they'll never know it was you. I want to challenge you. You want your heart to come alive? You want to get excited? But then you got to zip it. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone about it. It is so much fun. It is so much fun. Where are we? Verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, so they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. Don't do it. Later on in that verse, he says, go to your quiet place in your home. Go into a prayer closet. Go to a secluded place. Go to somewhere. What was Jesus doing in his entire ministry? I challenge you to read through the Gospels. Over and over and over, Jesus is trying to pull away. Why? To be with his heavenly Father in secret. He even tells his disciples, Guys, you're annoying me. I don't know. I just think, it's like, okay, enough. I need some time alone with, G with, with my heavenly Father. I need some time to spend with him. And what happens so many times, the crowds wouldn't leave him alone. They wouldn't leave him alone. Matthew 6, verse 18, the last part of that says, And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Ephesians, we're going to move along here. Ephesians 6, verses 6 to 8. Uh, obey, them, um, obey them not only to win their favor uh, when their eyes are on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly 
as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you uh, for whatever that they do. Luke 9, verses 23. Then he said to all of them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. It's a fine line. I've had lots of people talk about, actually just had someone today say, I didn't even know we, you know, they're a little bit newer to the church. I didn't know we fasted on Tuesdays. Well, we don't really advertise it. You didn't know? And you're a deacon? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I don't know how many times I have something someone's told me and I'm like, I had no idea that was in one ear out the other. But we don't advertise it like crazy. But I want to say, I want to challenge you. We do it once a week on Tuesdays. Join with the body of Christ in fasting and prayer. Join us in this, in this uh, uh, setting our hearts on the target of the, of the loss of our community. Fasting and praying for a year. I got to advertise it some or else people won't know. <laughs> we got to get it out there so people will know. But we're not championing it like somehow we're some great thing. No, we're just going, you know what? This is our target. This is what we're doing. Would you like to join us? That's what it's about. That's why I don't want to get into the details of fasting. If you want to have a conversation with me afterwards, I'd love to talk about fasting. It's, it's, it's awesome. But generally, it's, it's food. You're going to fast food. You're going to go to water or even a liquid diet. I mean, shoot, you can go without water for a day. I find it easier sometimes if it's just one day. Nothing. Dana's like, you're nuts. And I'm like, I find it easier because then there's just, it never instigates my digestive system at all. Anyways, I'm not saying you should try that or anything, whatever. But we're not going to advertise. We're not going to go crazy. But we want to set our hearts. Why? It's not for Aspen Ridge. It's so that Jesus will be famous. Guys, your life, your breath on this planet is doing one thing. It's declaring him. You breathing. Your life, you were created to give God glory. Do it in your relationships, do it in your work, do it in your, even your religious activity, like fasting and prayer, scripture reading, even in your church attendance for the glory of God. Amen. Let's stand. (coughs) Heavenly Father, teach us to be humble, Lord. God, we even have confidence because you are faithful. Hmm. You are faithful when we don't humble ourselves that you will humble us. But Lord, help us to partner with you in that process. That it doesn't take us off guard. That we're not like that baker who is taken completely off guard. Lord, help us to humble ourselves. Help us to understand what you're doing. Help us to partner with it. Jesus. You want us humble so that you can reproduce humility. Lord, and we think of the the opposite of humility is pride and arrogance. And Lord, we just ask that to be stripped out of our lives. Strip it out of this church. Strip it out of this body. Strip it out of this region. And God, sow humility into our lives. Teach us, Lord. We ask you to teach us how to be humble. In everything that we do, God, that we would take the low road. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless you all. (laughs) Testimony time. Who's got a testimony? What has God done in your life this week? You have a testimony? No. Lindy. Before I can even start, I'm already crying, so I'm like, obviously this is... My son is sitting in the parking lot. Oh, God, you're so good. You're so good. He just, he doesn't even have his driver's license yet, but he just bought a vehicle. And our van broke down on the way to go get it, so we're running his vehicle right now. Um, Tuesday night, I was passed right out on the couch. I was out like a light. It was a long weekend of being in Calgary, busy with my oldest daughter. It was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. 
Um, we came back, picked up his vehicle on Tuesday, came back with that, and I passed right out on the couch. Oh, I was out like a light. And usually I try to come Tuesday nights, but sometimes this happens. <laughs> So I'm laying on the couch. Both boys came, they kept bugging me over and over and over. And I was getting a little bit annoyed because I was having a good nap. But they kept coming in the living room and saying, Mom, aren't you going to church? Mom, when are you going to church? Mom, church, church. <laughs> but I was out like a light. I could hear them, but I was just laid out. Vincent came in, uh, the one that just bought the vehicle. And the last time, obviously the last time, and I can't remember word for word what he said, but it was something about, Mom, can I drive you to church? And I sat right up. <sighs> like, he knows. He knows my heart. He knows my heart that I just want my family here. <sighs> and he just sat me right up, just like that. It was like the most beautiful thing. And then my beautiful son who can be like the most horrible, please don't say that I'm like, you know, you know how kids are, teenagers. Like he can do really, really horrible things to me. But I know that's not to me. It's because I am, I'm trying to be the light for him. And he doesn't like that. <laughs> he still doesn't know God's love. Please pray for him to know God's love. <laughs> there is nothing like his love, you guys. Everybody needs his love. Do you know how many years I went without knowing what his love was like? Oh, 47 years I went without knowing what his love really was like. Like seriously, I was so brainwashed with the lies of what God was. Oh my gosh. Like I believe that God hated me and gave me cancer. I believe that, how many times did I almost die? I believe that was God doing that to me. I'm like, no, that was just because I had wicked ways in me. <laughs> I hadn't turned from my sin. I hadn't repented. I hadn't done that. You know what I mean? <sighs> Anyways, I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to thank God because <laughs> my beautiful son is in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Heavenly Father, so good. Lot, Vince, Vincent. Vince. So, Lord, we pray for Vincent right now. And Father, we just ask that your spirit would minister to his heart. Lord, that his heart would be softened. Soften his heart. And even though he was a long way off, the father ran, ran to him. Father, you see Vincent. You see his heart slowly beginning to turn to you. And Father, I, I just get this picture. You just jumped off your porch and you started the sprint towards Vince. Yeah. And then Michael, yep. and the rest of the family, Kevin, yeah. Yeah. Michelle, 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 Ashley, Ashley. Mom. Just everybody. everybody, 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 that's what we want. Everybody, yeah. yeah, amen. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, who's next? Oh, children's ministry. Yeesh, it's supposed to start at 11. It's Kay's fault. Oh, well, Dana's a part of the worship team, so it's his for her fault too. <laughs> sign your kids in, sign them out, parents. Talk to Dana, she's got the list. Where are you? Offering. We need to do offering. Someone else come and testify. Leo, you want to grab someone and hand out the offering baskets? We'll receive the offering. What has God been doing in your life? So last Sunday, I'm going to testify because it was pretty exciting. I like prepared this message on Galatians 1 where Paul's confronting some stuff in the church in Galatia. And I'm going to be careful here not to preach that message again. But, <laughs> but it was a strong salvation message because it was this religious doctrine had come into the church. 
And Paul is confronting it and saying, this isn't what the true gospel is. And so I preached, I don't know, I don't, it was a pretty strong gospel message. And there was like three, four, maybe even five people in the room that don't know Jesus. And I don't know who's going to show up from week to week. (laughs) I don't have a clue. I was targeting it at us as the believers going like, you know, we got to make sure it's not religious duty. But you also in, in the same hand have to present the true gospel of Christ's love and, and his work. And it was so exciting. In fact, there was a guy from our, um, our bus shop who came last Sunday and I was like, sweet, this is amazing. <laughs> right. God's working. Right. He's actually using the crisis of circumstances to work in and through those circumstances to reach people's hearts. And it's pretty neat to just, to see it begin to flush out, to see it begin to flush out. Yeah. Someone else, what's God doing? Yeah. Um, I praise God for uh, giving me strength this whole week because uh, everybody in, um, in my workplace are sick. And Eddie and me, <laughs> God strengthened us. Um, because uh, even I'm alone, or Eddie and uh, me working in the kitchen, uh, God give us strength. So that's all I thank God for the strength you've given us. That's good. That's good.